On this episode of The Lawyer You Know, we talk about how to go from being a lawyer to a judge. Most people know that for some time you have to be a lawyer before you can actually become a judge. And I bring my dad on to explain the process of how a lawyer becomes a judge. He served on judicial nominating commissions in the past. It's a group who does a lot of work in nominating lawyers and evaluating lawyers that potentially could become judges. We've done some podcasts and videos in the past that we'll link below on Supreme Court justice nominees, on the process of becoming a Supreme Court justice. And there are a ton of different judges and judicial positions that come available. So what I want to start out talking about, Dad, is what is the basic requirements for a lawyer to become a judge or even be considered for a judgeship? Well, there are different requirements for different levels of court. We've got four levels of court in Florida. We have the Supreme Court, we have district courts of appeal, we have circuit courts, we have county courts. For the Supreme Court, the district courts of appeals, it's 10 years as a lawyer. For county courts and circuit courts, it's five years of a lawyer. Uh, of course, they have to be members of the Florida Bar, and they in have Florida. to live right, and they have to live within the area that they're applying for a judgeship. So, if it's a Pinellas County judge, they have to live in Pinellas County. If it's a Pinellas County position that's open, a right. judgeship that's open. Okay, so you have to be a lawyer for at least five years for those lower level state courts, and you have to be a lawyer for at least ten years for the upper level ones. Correct. Okay. Anything else, or is it just how long you've been a lawyer, basically? Just how long you've been a lawyer to be eligible. Right now, there are, hey, there are exceptions. If you're in one of those small counties in North Florida where you only have forty thousand people in the county, then you can be just a lawyer and be nominated. So you don't have to have any experience. Right. Basically. And in fact, years ago, you didn't even have to be a lawyer to be a judge because those counties were so small, sometimes they didn't have a lawyer that lived in the whole county. Okay. But now we're large enough and so we can have this requirement. Okay, so but now you have to be a lawyer. Have to be a lawyer. And in what is the cutoff, 40,000 people in your county? Right. So if you have more than 40,000 people in your county, you still have to have that five or 10 year requirement. Correct. Okay, do you have to be a lower court judge, like a county court judge or circuit court judge before you can become an appellate court judge or a Supreme Court judge? There is no requirement for it. Any, there's no on the job training requirement or anything like that for you to apply to be a judge. Okay, so we've gotten the basic requirements out, the years of experience in being a lawyer. Talk about the process and the different ways that lawyers can become judges because you don't just apply and become a judge, you have to go through different processes. Explain what those are like. There's two ways in Florida to become a judge. One is you're appointed by the governor or two, you're elected by the people. And what we're talking about right now are state court judges. These are strictly state court judges. Okay, so that's important. We're gonna differentiate and talk about federal court later, but right now everything we're talking about is state court judges. So there's two ways appointed by the governor or voted on by the actual county that you're elected in. Right. Okay. The Supreme Court uh, justices and appellate court justices are always, those are always appointed by the governor. It's the circuit court, which are, we call the trial courts, and the county court, those are the ones that you can win by election. So the county court and circuit courts that you call the trial court, those are the ones that affect your lives. Those are the ones making the decisions in your cases for the majority of the time. They're the ones in criminal court and civil court that if you file a lawsuit or if you get arrested, your case is going to come before one of those judges that is usually elected by the local county that they're going to represent. So you have a voice, you have an opportunity to vote for local judges. And again, shameless plug, but also for extra explanation, we explain the entire voting process for judges and go through the local judges that get voted on in our county on this podcast that we're going to link in the comments below. Comment if you have any specific questions about how the local elections are handled and what you should look for in judges, how you should vote and if you should vote at all. So make sure you either comment below, go listen to our podcast, you can get more info on that because you actually have a chance to have a voice for the judges that are going to affect your lives. So there are also some situations where judges are appointed to those local positions, whether it's a county court judge or circuit court judge, why does that happen? And talk a little bit about how long these judges are in office. Right. Well, judges or are not in elected. office, I guess, but on well, the bench. Well, they're elected for six years, and they have to run again every six years. And However, is that across the board? Across County, the board. Circuit, appellate, Supreme Court. Correct. All six years. Okay. All six years. The difference is in the appellate court, the Supreme Court, and the district courts of appeal. Those are what's called merit retention votes. So people only vote on right. those judges 
to say we like them or don't like them. Uh, if you don't like them, then they're removed from office and then there's uh, somebody else appointed. It's not a contested election like the local judges, right, the state court right. or the and, trial court judges. And they're all nonpartisan, so there's no Republicans, there's no Democrats. All judges. All judges. Yeah, not just the appellate court ones. So, okay, so six year term. So, what happens in the lower level courts, the trial court? What happens that sometimes, because we see governors appoint some right. of those lower level judges? Why is that? If those judges leave office before their six year term is up, the governor has the option of appointing judges in their spots to finish out the term and then they have to run for election. But initially that first term they get appointed. These, what, what we're talking about now, the method of appointment for the state governors, are all states like this or just Florida? Uh, Florida, not all states are the same, but okay. Florida, this is Florida. So how does the process work when the governor actually appoints these judges? Well, the way it starts is once a judicial vacancy occurs, then within 60 days of that, the, the Judicial Nominating Commission. And the Judicial Nominating Commission is uh, a group appointed in every circuit, or there's one for the Supreme Court, there's one for every District Court of Appeals, but there's a Judicial Nominating Commission. There are nine people on the commission. The commission is totally appointed now by the governor, and that started in 2018. Before that, the Florida Bar appointed three, the governor appointed three, and those six appointed the other three. So who, who makes up that Judicial Nominating Commission? It's part lawyers and part <clears throat> non-lawyers. Um, normally it's the majority are lawyers and the minority are non-lawyers. And they're, again, they're all appointed by the governor. The Florida Bar recommends four lawyers and the governor appoints five other people and they can be lawyers or non-lawyers. Who are the other people usually that are chosen for well, they the non-lawyers? Well, governors always seem to find some non-lawyer people, some supporters some uh, spouses of supporters. Are they like uh, businessmen and women? Are they professionals? Are they random people? Are they lobbyists? Who are they? All of the above. Okay. They can be anybody. Uh, uh, stock, when I served on the uh, Judicial Nominating Commission, we had a stockbroker, we had a stay-at-home mom, we had all sorts of, of people of different races, employments, everything sat on the commission. And what are those conversations like when you're on the commission between the lawyers and the non-lawyers? Do the lawyers dominate the discussion or do they explain how the process works? What is that like when you're sitting in the meetings? Well, actually, uh, it really is very good. Uh, the non-lawyers are very active and it's interesting. The lawyers are very influenced by the way non-lawyers view the, the judiciary and view lawyers. Makes sense. And they're very influenced and they want to pick people to be lawyers. For instance, these trial court judges, the circuit count, they see people all day, every day at their worst in some cases. Mm -hmm. And so these non-lawyers on the commission understand that and they want sympathetic people who understand what real people in real life is like. And not just lawyers, because sometimes lawyers get kind of isolated from the real world. Okay, so the governor appoints this general, the JNC is what we call it. So we'll probably just refer to it as the JNC from now on. So the governor appoints this JNC and then how does the process take place from there? Then there's an advertisement. <clears throat> Any lawyer who wants can apply to be a judge. And you might get 60 or 70 or 80 people applying and they fill out a long application, all their finances, everything they own, every, every time they voted, just everything is in this packet and it's sent to the nine members. Is it an application? Are they trying to convince you to pick them or is it just something they give you that's just raw data? It's raw data, but okay. let's be honest with you, they make sure that raw data reflects why they would be good judges. Uh, their work experience, all sorts of uh, family experiences are in there and they can put anything they want. We had some people put in a family album uh, into their application to show you know, what great family people mm -hmm. they were. We had uh, all sorts of stuff that's that stuffed in there to you know, bring it to our attention. Then the nine members meet and we decide of that, let's say 70 applications, who we're gonna live interview. And we'll try to limit it to maybe 20 or 30 people of live interviews. Those 20 or 30 people are then brought in one at a time and questioned by the nine members. So what happens after the live interviews with the JNC? Well, then the JNC meets those nine members. And that meeting, by the way, is not a government in the sunshine meeting. Uh, it's done in secret. And they sit around and discuss the candidates. They are then required to send to the governor a minimum of three and a maximum of six individuals that they feel are qualified to become judges. So they send those up to the governor for review. The governor either accepts them or rejects them. He does not have to accept that. Sometimes the governor has sent back the names and said, look, 
do another round and send me another group. That happens a lot, right? Where yeah. the, the governor will send back and say, I want different names. Sometimes the governor will do that for various reasons. One is maybe it's not a diverse enough group. Maybe you know we don't have minorities represented in the nominations or not enough women in the nominations. So the governor will send it back for a more diverse group and then he will select who he wants out of that group. But that process is also a different kind of process of what happens at the governor's office. So before we get there, it's supposed to be a non-political process. Right, right? non-partisan, so, right. right. But it's supposed to be non-political because the judges are just supposed to be unbiased you know, referees, basically, in our cases. But That's if really, the governor, right. whatever political party the governor is associated with, is picking the Judicial Nominating Commission and picking the judges, obviously it's a pretty political process. Well, we can, I can tell you that when we sent names up, we, nine times out of ten, we could pick the one the governor was going to pick. We knew who the governor was going to pick. For instance, somebody who'd been uh, an attorney for the Republican Party or someone who we know was very active in Republican politics or for the governor, we knew that person had a better chance. So what we were sending up were qualified candidates because we made sure they were qualified and then the governor makes a selection. It's much more political at the governor's office than it is at the JNC. So what, what happens at the governor's office? At the governor's office, the, uh, he'll look at the three or the six. He'll then interview them. He actually brings them up to Tallahassee. He personally doesn't do it, but he has somebody in his staff interview all the picks and then come back to him with a recommendation and he selects the individual that's going to be a judge. How long does this entire process take um, from when somebody applies and sends in their information to the JNC and tries to be a judge to when they're actually confirmed and they're a judge? The, when the governor sends the name to the, or not the name, but the uh, vacancy to the JNC, they have 60 days to send a recommendation back up to him to fill the vacancy. When they send that back up to him, the governor has 60 days in order to make a selection for judgeship. Okay, so is there always a JNC? Just whenever whenever a vacancy comes up, they're ready to go? In Florida, there is always a JNC. Okay. Not in all states, but in Florida, there always is because so the JNC like, is constitutional. It's not like a vacancy comes up and then the governor's like, okay, I'm going to create a JNC now. No, there's always okay. a JNC sitting. Okay, so uh, and a lot of people watching this are either lawyers or potential lawyers that are one day thinking about becoming judges. Um, what are some of the reasons that lawyers become judges, leave their practice behind and become a judge? Well, th there's two basic reasons. One is you're a young lawyer and you always felt like what you wanted to be was a judge to help people. That was really the, the way that you wanted to progress your legal career. So you're pursuing it because you really didn't want private practice. You really don't like private practice. You'd rather be up there doing what judges do. That's one way. The other are the older got people. There are older lawyers who they've had their career, they have done everything they can to succeed in their career as, as private practice lawyers or as prosecutors or as public defenders. And now it's a next stage in their progression. So now as an older lawyer, they want to be a judge. And a lot of people like the clout and the the prestige that become that it, that comes with being a judge, you know, sitting on the bench wearing the robe, making the decisions, and they become big shots when they're judges. Um, what are the salaries? Because it's all public record, right? So, what yes. are the salaries for these different levels of judges um, that people are applying for or get appointed to? Well, Florida ranks about 26 in the 50 states as where they have so right their judges the pay, right? Right in the middle. Our Supreme Court makes $220,000. District Court of Appeal judges are 169,000, uh, circuit judges are 160, and county judges are 151,000. Keep in mind, to show for comparison, the governor makes 130,000. So these are you know, the highest paid employees uh, in the state as a group are the judges. Did the chief judges make any more than the rest? The Florida like Supreme Court chief judge does. The other chief judges normally do not. How does a judge become a chief judge? Uh, chief judges are elected by their peers. In other words, if you're a Florida Supreme Court justice, the other justices elect the chief judge. Same for the district courts of appeal, circuit courts. If you're going to name a chief judge, it's the judges in your group that elect you. And how does it rotate or how does it work? Uh, the terms are for two years and they're reelected every two years. Sometimes you've got some chief judges that say they're 10 or 15 years as chief judge. Sometimes they only stay two years, but it's a two-year uh, cycle.
So we focused a lot on the state process. Let's transition a little bit to federal, which most of our, or a lot of our podcasts focus on this as well, but let's quickly try to go through, is there an age cap on state justices? We yes. talked about they had to be at least a lawyer for five or 10 years, but for state judges, is there a max age? A recent Supreme Court amendment raised that from 70 to 75. So at 75 on their 75th birthday, they have to retire. Okay, so you can't be any older than 75. Can't be any older okay. than 75. So what about federal court judges? How does it work? How does a lawyer become a federal court judge? Um, how does that process differ from state? Well, number one, the judicial nominating commissions are not required for federal judge selections. We have it in Florida, and that's because our two senators have agreed to do it that way. A lot of states, the senator on his own picks his best friend or picks somebody he knows, and he gets sent up to, for a judgeship. In Florida, we have to go through the same process as the state. They put out an advertisement saying, look, you want to be a federal judge? Apply the Judicial Nominating Commission. They're appointed by the senators if they have a senator that is of the same party as the president. If you don't, then it's a congressman. Then they interview everybody just like they do in the state court, and then they send recommendations up to the senator. The senator then picks the one person out of the recommendation they like then that person goes to the president, and then the president has a process through the Department of Justice. They investigate, they do background checks, then the president makes an appointment, and then I'm going to shortcut it, and then goes to the United States Senate for advice and consent or approval of the appointment. Now, if you remember, I didn't mention the Florida State Senate, because in Florida, when the governor makes the appointment, that person's a judge. He does not have to go to the Florida Senate for approval. Okay, so that's a big difference. So they have to be confirmed by the United States Senate, but the state court judges, at least in Florida, don't have to be confirmed by anybody if the governor picks them. That's right. Okay. Big difference. Right. So what is the uh, tenure, as we like to say, for federal court judges? Federal court judge is a lifetime appointment. Life, appointed for life. Anybody. Yeah. Any it, federal judge, lifetime and appointment. And it makes a big difference in how they act and rule on cases and how things are and how quickly they move right. things or change hearings on us yeah, right. with, you know, they reckless don't have, They don't have to campaign every six years. Right. They don't have to be popular. They can say, show up today. Actually, we're going to move it to next week, whether you have something right. or not. Right. Um, okay. And then what are the salaries for federal court judges? Well, a district court judge is 200, that's the basic trial court. And that's the one that I have is $216,400. Okay, so more than state court judges. More than state okay, court judges. so federal judges, court judges yes. make more than that. So why would somebody want to be a federal court judge versus a state court judge? Or why, why is there the difference in what type of people are attracted to the different positions? Well, federal judges deal with bigger cases. Um, uh, there's minimum financial cases, there's federal crimes. They just deal with a bigger case type, but a smaller case load. They don't have as many cases in federal court. So it's seen as a better position, right. more prestigious position. Right. Is it often that state court judges become federal court judges or just straight from lawyer to federal court it judge? It happens quite a bit. Uh, in fact- Which way? What happens is that the state ones become federal. Okay. And I have never seen it go the other way. Uh, well, just recently though, two Florida Supreme Court justices appointed by uh, Governor DeSantis, both of them got elevated to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, a federal appellate court by Trump, within like a week of each other. So he plucked two state court judges from the Supreme Court and put them in the appellate court in the federal system. Okay, so what is the percentage, would you say, that state court judges versus just regular lawyers make the jump to federal court judge. That's what I'm asking. Oh, yeah. So like, is it more lawyers? Is it 50-50? I Does would it say it's, prob it's probably a 50-50 okay. split. Okay, so it's not, com it's not more common for you to take that as a stepping stone to become right. a state court judge than federal court judge. You can go just straight to federal court. Right. So if you, does it help if you have a lot of federal court practice, if you're a federal prosecutor or whatever, getting a federal judgeship versus state? It's hard to say what really will help. Uh, for instance, we just, politics, obviously, right. that's the number I mean, one. So there's some federal judges uh, that are federal judges, but when there were uh, regular lawyers, never tried a case, yet they became federal judges. There are uh, prof law professors, never tried a case, but became federal judges. Uh, you really can't say, uh, and it really goes to the whim of the president when you really so, think about it. So really, the judges that are appointed 
have a lot less scrutiny almost, it sounds like, than the judges that are voted on because people can look into and pick what they want the most versus just kind of one person or a group of nine people looking in and seeing if you check the boxes that they feel is important. I, 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 in my opinion, I would disagree with that. Okay. I would. I think the people selected by judicial nominating commissions are, on the average, better qualified than elections because elections is a popularity contest. People don't really know the qualifications. They don't really look at the person. The JNCs know the lawyers. They know who to ask. They know what to ask. They know what to look for. So I would, I would support the JNC approach to the nomination. I mean, it's judges. definitely more scrutiny because they have to go through the process, go through the interviews, apply, have the governor pick them. But to me, it seems like a lot more political process, a lot more who you know. Then, I mean, the popularity contest, that's what an election is is who is more popular, who do the people want. That is a popularity contest. And I think that if people are looking for the right things and judges, then I think that can be the better way. I'm not, I'm not saying it is because I do think the JNC obviously picks better judges than are, than are voted on. But I do think that the JNC does put, on, put up good candidates, obviously. I'm not saying there are any bad candidates that become judges. I just like the people's voice being heard and picking who's gonna make the determining factor in their case. And with that being said, what are some of the qualities when we do look to local judges and we vote for local judges, what are some of the qualities we should look for in lawyers that would make them good judges? Well, when I was doing the interviews at JNC, what I was really looking for is someone that had compassion, uh, someone that really understood the, the common man, someone that really would sympathize with people that he was, he was judging. So, so not just somebody that is going to look at it black and white, make calls, not caring what the consequences are, right. how this person's life may be affected, how much money they're going to have to waste on, you know, depending on what the judge's rulings are. Right, because there's a lot of smart people, a lot of smart people, a lot of smart lawyers. But if that lawyer doesn't have a heart, then he really isn't going to be a good judge. What are some of the other things? Diversity of, of uh, practice areas, they've done different things, trial experience. What other things do you think are important? Uh, well, the trial experience is very important. Since that's, in fact, what they're going to be doing all is all day, every day. trials. Now, that's different for the appellate court judges right. because they're more academic. Uh, they are, are thinking more about the law rather than dealing with individual people. Uh, but, but again, we don't vote for those. So I'm talking got, specifically what we're going to vote for on the elections in local. I, I think they should have decent academic credentials. I think that they should wow, be... Wow, high bar. They should, well, they should be compassionate because there are some people, honestly, that are very good judges. They may not be brilliant, but they are just really good judges because they're good people and they understand what people are going through that they face every day in their courtrooms. Uh, you know, people's lives are in their hands, so they have to be able to understand that and appreciate that. All right, so if anybody has any questions about what it takes to be a judge or wants any more information, feel free to leave a comment, like the video, and subscribe if you want more content like this. Thanks for being with us today.